Um, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the um, fourth Carla Historical and Archaeological Society lecture, which has been online for the winter series, spring series 2020-2021. And for the first time ever tonight, um, our lecture is being um, streamed live into a number of local nursing homes. And I'd say, I'd like to say hello to all those who are in those nursing homes who have been in lockdown to a greater degree than most of us. Um, tonight's pr lecture promises to be one of our best, I'd say, of the season. Um, but before we begin, there are a number of housekeeping items I'd like to cover. Um, first of all, as I said earlier, please ensure microphones are muted because we don't want echoes, dogs, and general background noises. Um, we'll take questions at the end of the lecture. So if you want to ask a question, just put a question mark in the chat and we'll pick it up uh, at the end and we'll try and get around to them all. The lecture is being transmitted via a number of different online platforms and platforms not belonging to the society as well. So if you happen to see differences, there will be a delay in sound, there will be a delay in picture. So bear with us if you're looking at it on a different platform. Um, and thanks to a number of different societies who have um, helped us in this regard. Um, as you're aware, the society, despite the fact that we don't have what I would describe as room costs for a lecture, we still have a number of admin costs, affiliation fees, secretarial expenses and the like. And without the face-to-face -face lectures, we're missing the donations we'd normally get at those. So those who are on Facebook and elsewhere, you'll see a tip jar, a PayPal tip jar available if you wish to make donations. On a similar note, if you're not a member of the society, we encourage you to join, or if you are a member to renew and support the society. It's only 15 euros a year. Uh, you can do so by going on to carlohistorical.com and you'll see the um, online form there. You can pay by PayPal or you can pay via our PO box, PO box 162 Carlo. So we go along to tonight's lecture. Um, and I suppose from a perspective of the type of lecture we have, um, it's going to cover Mount Leinster from the historic past to the present day, from prehistory to windmills and the whole area, what I would say is from Clonagall the whole way down to St Mullins. Um, we have a wonderful lecturer, Dr. Kevin Whelan, um, himself a Clonagall Gall man, even if he is on the Wexford side of it. Um, the last time I listened to Kevin uh, was in Huntington Castle in October 2019, which seems now a lifetime ago uh, as part of the Carlo Big Houses Month. Um, the other thing uh, with Kevin, Kevin has been an invaluable source for everybody who is interested in local history. Um, and there is a lecture which he gave back in 1990 in St. Patrick's at a local history seminar entitled Sources for Local History. And he's been kind enough to allow us to put it up on our website. And it's as relevant today as it was back then. Um, so rather than give a long, lengthy introduction to what the lecture covers, I'll hand over to Kevin if you're ready. And um, again, if everyone switches the microphones off, and if you find that there's a problem with bandwidth, please switch your, switch your cameras off as well, and we'll all just listen to this, and we'll do questions at the end. Thanks very much. Yeah, we're good, Robert. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Gramil Magot uh, Farik, um, and thanks to the Carla Historical for um, indulging me in talking about the uh, Blackstairs. Uh, my wife always says that I was born on the side of a mountain, not quite born on one of the side of the, the foothills of the Blackstairs, but I did definitely go in the shadow of the Blackstairs. And uh, I sometimes think the Blackstairs are actually underappreciated as a mountain range, and indeed, um, as a uh, tourist attraction uh, because they're shared between Wexford and Carlow and maybe when if, if the Blackstairs were exclusively in Carlow or exclusively in Wexford uh, we might get our act together more. They're a very beautiful place and a very historic place as I'll try to uh, show but um, in the lockdown we've learned more than ever the value of nature and uh, 
Robert and I, my colleague here, were just talking how much we love. I don't even like looking at that slide at the moment because it's making me uh, nostalgic for being up a mountain. Anyway, uh, let's talk about uh, Mount Leinster. The, the name, as you um, probably know, comes from the Irish uh, Stua line. I've been thinking about that today. I think the first reference I've had to um, Mount Leinster is actually uh, quite late. I don't think it was called Mount Leinster until well up into the 16th or indeed 17th century. Before that, it was known as Sleeve Line or even Stua Line. You can see it here. This is the earliest um, map uh, reference uh, I have to it. It's from uh, Robert Lyde's map. And it, unusually too, it shows a, a cross on the top of Mount Leinster. And I'm not too sure that the archeologists or anybody else have um, um, established what the hell that was. It may have been removed after the Reformation. But again, it just shows how much we don't know about um, these places. Uh, next one there, Robert. Um, only recently, this is my native uh, Clonigal. This is from Valentine Gill's map from 1807. Only recently I discovered this is the Gibbet Hill here, which is between Cora um, and uh, Greg Moore, just on the right on the Carlow Wexford border. Uh, recently, the local people down there did a brilliant job in terms of creating a walking route up to the top of Gibbet Hill, which has a, a, a Marian cross on the top of it. But what's also there, which I never realized before in the next one there, um, is that, Robert, mm -hmm. yeah, in the, the 16th century map, this is. Robert Lyde's map, recycled by speed of this area. You can see County Carlow there. You can see uh, Carnew up at the top. You can see Clonmullen, which I'll be talking about later. Ferns down in the bottom. But right up to the upper right there, you can see a place called Knock Swiffin. Now that's Canuck Sea Fion. Canuck Sea Fion, which means the hill of the seat or the vantage point of Fion. And a Fion there is Fion McCool. And what that means is that this place here was one of the hunting grounds of the Fianna. And we all know about the Fianniach, the great uh, sagas of the hunters of the, of the Fenians, the old Fenians. Um, and what that meant was that this place here was on a political boundary and that it was uh, a place where, which was considered appropriate uh, for hunting. But it's only very recently that it's been identified that that's what that was. And of course, what that reminds us is that mountains are places which tend to conserve um, history. History it tends to preserve better up the farther upslope you go. And we're looking at the Blackstairs, and here I want to acknowledge the work of Seamus and Moraku and others, uh, in terms of the recent, the last 20 years or so, the recent uh, marvelous discoveries of the prehistoric rock art along the uh, Blackstairs. And um, this is the one at the uh, Rat Gear. Um, and again, uh, only a fool would say they know what those markings are, but they're um, obviously of spiritual and aesthetic significance. Here's a map showing that rock art for the whole of the island. What you can see clearly on that is how important the Wicklow Mountains and the Blackstairs actually are. And if we zone in a little tighter onto um, the Blackstairs, you can just see how many are along, especially the Carlo side, um, the western side of the Blackstairs. There's 10 very fine examples of a rock art. Uh, running from north to south along the black stairs uh, on the Carlo side, Knock Brack, Coolish Knock, the Knock Scar, Ballankillen, Spa Hill, uh, Crana, Knock Moor, Knock Row, Ragirn, and Tinnacarry. Um, and again, that's a, a, just a sign of how much archaeology, how much of interest there is um, on the, the mountains. Mountains are also, generally speaking, conservative places, conservative in the sense that. The history tends to kind of flow around them. And in between then, um, you know, the history kind of speeds up, but mountains act as barriers. The great historian of uh, this generation in Asia, James Scott, once said that states can climb mountains. So what he meant was that the control of the state, the power of the state, finds it very difficult to control mountainous areas, whether they're in Asia, South America, or Ireland. And in Ireland, we, the mountains, were refuge areas and the mountains were areas that the state, as we'll try to show later on, found very, very difficult uh, to control. And uh, if we look at uh, Carlo and Wexford, um, one of the key distinctions we have to make is that Carlo has a plain. And uh, you know, if you look across the middle of Carlo, say from uh, um, Ballon across to Tolo, up to Carlo town, you've got a tremendous uh, plain. Um, it is a very, very fine uh, agricultural uh, terrain, 
among the most fertile lands, most fertile tillage lands anywhere in Europe, very, very level, really with just the ballon as a kind of a, a little hill uh, in the middle of that plain. And as King Richard II himself said in the 14th century, the most famous, fair and fertile plain uh, in Ireland. And of course, even to the present day, it's the granary of Carlow, isn't it? It's a very good tillage land, great barley uh, produced there, really good quality land, but very flat and level and uh, easy, therefore, to control and easy, therefore, for people like the butlers pushing in from the Kilkenny side and the great Fitzgerald dynasty in Kildare. It was relatively easy for them to push the Kavanaghs, who had control of that, to push them out of Ballylock and out of Ballymoon, uh, push right across the plains, but they came up against um, a barrier when they actually hit the Blackstairs. And the Kavanaghs were able to hang on much better in Gary Hill, much better in Burris down to the south, and much better at Clonmullen, which we saw on that first slide there. And the, the earliest representation we have of the Wexford landscape is this one here. This is the famous illustration of uh, Richard II's army and Art McMurrah uh, coming down from the mountains uh, to uh, attack them. Now, what I love about that slide is it shows clearly the, the symbolic distinction between the, the Norman knights, if we might call them that, on their much larger horses uh, on the plain, and then the Irish up on the mountains and the woodlands, the oak woodlands behind them. But mountain and woodland were seen by the English and the Anglo-Irish at that stage as being dangerous kind of terrain. And Art McMurray Cabinet comes dashing down on his small little horse, a hobby horse, it's where we get the expression hobby horses. The hobby, uh, the hobby horse was the Irish horse, much smaller than the, the English ones, but much quicker, much more agile, and very well able to maneuver in tight spaces. And this illustration also has something very, very famous uh, in it, which is that Art McMurray rides barefoot but he's wearing spurs. And what was, why was that? It wasn't that he couldn't afford the uh, shoes. Art McMurray Cabinet had um, uh, ownership of 14,000 cattle, which even today a Texas uh, rancher might be proud of. Uh, but what he was kind of saying was, you guys, you're over there in your armor and whatever, right? But we're tough. I can ride a bareback and I can ride with spurs in my feet, right? Are you as tough as me? And a, a, a term, uh, a, a nickname that the Cavanaghs used was, if there were, a guy was particularly tough, was to put the nickname on Iron, the of the Iron. So you might have Art on Iron, Macchiavanni. And that meant the Iron Man, as we might now say. And they, they were sending a kind of a message. So the Barefoot King was kind of saying, you're not going to roll over me, guys. You're like the English pack last uh, Saturday in... Uh, in um, Lansdowne Road or the Aviva, as we now should call it, I suppose. I still call it Lansdowne Road. You know, we're not going to just roll over and have our bellies tickled now, are we? But, it, but the image is already setting up that striking distinction between the mountain and the plain. And again, um, the cavernous became very entrenched in Gary Hill. And it's in the 16th century and uh, 17th century, we have descriptions of what they were doing. Like these people were not uncivilized. This is. Um, the famous charter horn, the, the Cown Curran, or the Curran Cown, the crooked uh, drinking horn, which was part of the, uh, the rights of uh, investing kingship uh, in the cabinets. And the cabinets of Gary Hill were also the people who were looking after the Book of Moling and looking after the magnificent binding on that book, which is now in Trinity uh, College. And they, they were patrons of poets, patrons of musicians, patrons of harpers, and a, a very significant uh, group of people. But the cabinets had been pushed back out of Carlow by the butlers, by the Fitzgeralds, and were just kind of pushed onto the fringes of uh, the um, the fringes of um, the Blackstairs. The reason for that, of course, too, was that the butlers and Fitzgeralds were very concerned to keep the Barrow Valley Passage open. The, the also very keen on trying to maintain the link down to New Ross into South Wexford and what was then called the Wexford Pale. And the, the cabinets, especially in, in South Carlow, St. Mullins, Palmounty, uh, across towards Great Namana, there was always the risk that they would sever the link along the barrow. They would then stop the link with the, all those Browns and Debrickses and Sinnets and all those Normans, uh, Furlongs and whatever. 
Tyke Furling had a good game on Saturday, very good. But the, the, the Norman guys of South Wexford, that they would be cut off from the pale. And that what would also happen is that the Cavanaghs and their numerous acolytes, the Nolans and the O'Neills and the Murphys and all those tough mountainy men from North Wexford, Carlow and South Wicklow, the Burns and the O'Tools as well, that they would then be able to push across and link up with the O'Moors and the O'Connors and the kind of bogmen of uh, Offaly and Leash and uh, uh, bits of Kildare, and that that would isolate the pale even more. So there was a huge effort to cut off the cabinets. Uh, back there, Robert, uh, uh, one or two. Uh, uh, and when Richard II came to Ireland in uh, 1398, that's par uh, part of what he was trying to do, was to actually cut uh, the cabinets off and to secure the linkage between the, the Northern Pale, as we might call it, and the Southern Pale. And um, there's a very famous um, unresolved historical mystery in this, because Richard II got as far as Gary Hill and smoked the cabinets out of Gary Hill. And after that, he attacked the cabinets in another location. And it's always been very unclear what that location is. It's also always been assumed by those who write about it that uh, Richard II or his troops kept going north of Michel, Gary Hill, Michel, and came around kind of to Kildavan and in somewhere in that area there, just on the borders of um, Carlow and Wexford, just on the, where the Slaney and the Derry meet, that it was somewhere in there that he surprised again one of the cabinet leaders um, and, uh, you know, took him completely by surprise. But it's never been clarified where that is. Now, my suggestion, and I'm very willing to take... Um, correction on this, but my suggestion, and some of you will know this area much better than I do, my suggestion is that from Gary Hill, Gary Hill is just on the left of this uh, map here, this is from uh, the map of Carlow from 1798, I'm sorry it's not much better quality than it is, but uh, that from there, from Gary Hill, instead of going towards Kildavan, I think that what the troops did was they dropped over the Corabut Gap, which is just um, on the map here, and then drop down into what is now the head of Kilbanish Valley, and then what's just below that, only Clonmullen Castle. So I actually think that where, where Richard II guys were striking at was actually Clonmullen. And uh, I also believe, or think, that the reason why Clonmullen was then built as a castle, and it was a very fine tower house uh, later in the 16th, 17th century, was uh, to be able to resist a raid like that. So one of the, uh, one of the suggestions I have from this lecture would be that it would be a really interesting thing to look at this in more detail and to actually get a group of people to walk from Gary Hill up over the Corbett Gap down to Clonmullen and see how long it would take and whether or not you could get horses and other kind of things uh, up there. But there you go. But my main point here is, is not so much about that, but the fact that the cabinets had been pushed out of the plain of Carlo, pushed across onto the edge of the mountain and, uh, you know, that that's where the, the cavernous strength and intensity was in the late 16th, early 17th century. And again, this is to do entirely with the topography. Here's that, um, here's the Corabut Gap now shown on the modern aerial photograph with Kilbanish Valley there to your right, the road just running across under the Carlo side up there from Kulnish Nocta, um, running across and down into Kilbanish. But the main point here is that this world, the world of the mountains, was where the Gaelic families uh, could survive. Um, in the civil survey from the mid 17th century, it says uh, about Carlo, all upon the borders of this county, the land is generally barren and rocky and not good and commendable as that within the county itself. So that this county may be, may be compared to a good piece of tapestry with canvas borders. A good piece of tapestry with canvas borders. That is that they, you know, get very ragged and rugged and rocky and mountainy. Now, again, though, important to understand that this world is also um, a mountain world. And in the Gaelic tradition, the mountains were valuable for one essential reason. And that is that they provided very good, especially winter pasturage and summer pasturage for cows. And the Irish Gaelic uh, families they had the little black cattle. The black cattle, there's only about 500 left in the country now, the Kerry black cattle, as they call them. They're down on the Killarney National Park. You'll see them as you come into Killarney very often. Um, 
But the thing about those little cattle was they were very small, but they were extremely hardy. They could survive very well on the mountain. Uh, if there was a kind of a soft winter, as we say in Ireland, they could manage up on the mountain without ever bringing them in. You didn't need to cut hay or uh, anything like that. And therefore, that was a really, really important um, um, quality uh, that the cattle uh, had. So in the civil survey, he's, it says, and this is talking about the black stairs, it says the tops of the said mountains are a summer pasture for great cattle, but in the winter boggy and very cold for want of shelter. Now, the way the Irish dealt with that was the system of Boolean. Boolean in the Irish, B-U-A-I-L-E, which was that you went up in the summer and you maybe had a, a, a little stone cabin or whatever, and you went up with the cattle, you, you got the milk at that stage, you perhaps made butter, put it in the firkins, uh, brought it. Again, back on there, Robert, and very important too, that all along the slopes, from north to south, from uh, Clonigal, down to Michel, down to Ballymurphy, Rahanna, down all the way as far as uh, St. Mullins, as Parik said earlier, that southern uh, fringe of the Black Stairs was a very distinctive region. Still is to the present day. This was the part of Carlo that didn't become anglicised. It was the part of Carlo that remained Irish speaking. Um, if you look at the field names in, along the, the Black Stairs slopes, even to the present day, their Irish um, field names indicating that Irish hasn't vanished all that long ago here. Well up into the 1830s and 1840s, um, these parishes that I've just mentioned were still Irish speaking. Very important to understand and remember that New Ross, for example, was strongly Irish speaking, in part because it had a very strong uh, Irish speaking area in South Kilkenny on the other side of it. But that the hinterland of New Ross was essentially Irish speaking and every shopkeeper and publican um, in New Ross had to be able to speak uh, Irish uh, to, to deal uh, with the locals. So again, there, it's, it's only slowly that the Kavanaugh power fades in this region. And even then they managed pretty well to survive the 17th century. The Northern Kavanaugh's got pushed out. Ballylochan and Ballymoon Kavanaugh's, they just disappear in the late 16th, early 17th century. But the Southern Cabinets, Gary Hill, which was later spawned, the Boris branch, managed to survive. And it's the survival of the Cabinet estate in South Carlow, now based at Boris, but also with them, another Catholic family, the Bagnalls, who took over from the Crews in Adrone. Those two very large estates didn't bring in new tenants, didn't bring in planters, didn't bring in plantation villages. And it really kept the culture very, very intact. Sometimes when we think about places like Carlow and Wexford, when people think about them, if they think about them at all, they tend to think of them as being very anglicized kind of places. Now, that's not true. The Gaelic heritage of Carlow and Wexford is immense, and it's even more immense and stronger and more intense the farther up the mountain you, you, uh, you go. But as I say, the Cavanaghs were under immense pressure the butlers in particular wanted to push across to South Carlo, push across into New Ross and even push into uh, Wexford. You find Mount Garrett Castle and other butler fortifications around New Ross. And one of the things they wanted to do was in particular to control the two passages. The, the one here at uh, Skullog, and take the next one, Robert. Uh, and then uh, even more so, the, the gap at Palmonte. The Barrow Valley was what they were really intensely interested in. And they built this, which is one of the first um, pentagonal five-sided forts. This is a fort at Coolihoon, which is about a mile and a half from St. Mullins. But the idea of that fort, which was paid for by the five counties, by Waterford, Kilkenny, Carlow, Wexford, and bits of Tipperary. The whole idea of that was to protect the trade of, Ro of New Ross, and also, in very important, to maintain the uh, link all the way up along the Barra Valley, up to Lachlan Bridge, up to Thai, and then from there link up with the, the pay. So this, this fort here, whose first um, captain was Anthony Coakley of the Tintron family, uh, um, and Henry Wallop, the, the very tough and in some ways genocidal um, guy who set up the town of Enniscorthy in its modern uh, incarnation, uh, Wallop was very keen to finance this as well. But this was a way of keeping manners on the cabinets and allowing the butlers 
uh, to extend their influence from Kilkenny Castle right into Carlow and uh, Wexford. So again, uh, just the, the pressure and the significance of this in the 16th and early 17th century is the immense pressure that people like the Kavanaugh's uh, were coming under. And yet the Kavanaugh's managed to uh, kind of tough it out. And um, even into the 17th century, the Mount Leinster area was still Kavanaugh country. Here's a description from 1660. The county of Carlock, Carlock, the Four Lakes, lies on the northwest of, and the northwest on which the soil is mountainous. The famous mountain called Mount Leinster lying there. And that's the first time I've seen the phrase Mount Leinster. The famous mountain called Mount Leinster lying there late in the possession of Donica Ak Derry. That's uh, one of the cabinets who is described as the Tory governor of Leinster, which by means of the great adjoining woods had always been haunted with Irish Tories or wood currents. Wood current who the English were very afraid of. The Irish liked fighting in the woods. The English were afraid to go near um, Ireland in the summer when the old woods were in, uh, in leaf. And they were afraid to go there in the winter when it got foggy and they could literally get bogged down. So there was only really a, a little time in the autumn when they were comfortable fighting. But they wouldn't touch these mountainous areas uh, in the earlier uh, period. There's St Mullins, which as I say, is on the point, pinch point. Um, on the barrow, right back to the medieval period, you've got the Mott there, which is controlling the river crossing there and controlling the gap of Palmonte, as it was, which allowed for, um, you know, a passage between Wexford and Kilkenny. So St. Mullins was strategically hugely, hugely uh, important. And of course, the river, the tide came up along the barrow and the boats could come up as far as St. Mullins as well. And of course, being able to bring the boats up on the tide and then come down on the tide when the tide ebb was a brilliant kind of uh, thing. Remember, it was six times, six times cheaper to carry stuff by river than by road until the advent of a railway system. We'll keep going there, uh, Robert, for the moment, yeah. Okay, so there's uh, Mount Leinster shown now for the first time on a map. This is the down survey map, the famous map by uh, William uh, Petty. And you can see there Mount Leinster with the great uh, uh, townland of Cranmore shown on the north of it. Interesting, Clonigal it doesn't get a look in, but Cranmore does. The toughest uh, footballers that ever played with my club, Kildavan, came from Cranmore. Now they were proper mountainy men. And when we had a full back line, which was consisted of lads from Cranmore, nothing got through them. Um, Kildavan spent three years without losing a match in the 1960s. But it was also because if we were losing with five minutes to go, we started the row and everybody ran for cover. <laughs> that's another story. But they were tough men, the men from Cranmore. And uh, it's interesting that that's what's shown on the, the down survey map. And over to your right there, you've got Farron O'Neill, the, ter the territory of the O'Neills who controlled the Clonigal area. And right south of that is um, Clonmullen, which as I've explained earlier, Clonmullen, very important cabinet uh, settlement um, everybody kind of thinks of it as being in Wexford. It's actually in County Carlow, um, not too far from Bunclody there. And of course, was totally flattened in the 17th century. But there's no site in Carlow or Wexford more historically important than Clonmullen. And it's such a tragedy that the castle was demolished, literally stone upon a stone, because nowadays people don't understand how significant it was. It was the, that was where Donald Spaniard, the cabinet, Kevanok, Donald Sponok or Kevanok also lived uh, later on. And a remarkable uh, guy who had gone to um, Spain as a page with Thomas Stukeley, the Elizabethan adventurer, when he was only nine or 10 years old, hence the name Donald Sponok, Donald of Spain, and then managed to survive all the way to die in his, in his bed in the 1630s, still in possession of his estate. Some going with the pressure he was under. But uh, as I said, it's Mount Leinster. Is, it's interesting that it shows it there. And again, down to the south as we come on to what we now call um, the White Mountain. Next one there, Robert. Yeah. So the, the, the Black Stairs are, you know, with Clonmullen on the Clonigal, Kildavan side of it, Clontrody side of it. You've got Gary Hill on the Michel side of it. And then down to the south, you've got um, St. Mullins. Um, and what later became uh, the great uh, cabinet of Burris estate. So the cabinet is still very well entrenched on both sides of the Blackstairs. One of the key things in the Blackstairs too, and this is what I was saying earlier about mountains, roads and communications tend to flow around mountains. 
It's like that um, Yeats poem, Easter 1916, the stones in the midst of all, the mountains in the midst of all, the roads have to kind of flow around it. This is a wonderful map. It's available on the Yale University website for those of you who are interested. There's tremendous detail in it. This is uh, Heinrich Moll's map, M-O-L-L, -L, Heinrich Moll's map of 1714. And I've just shown you here, because this is important for the communication side of it. I have focused on my own village there of Clonigal, which is down in the, the bottom center of the image. But what is striking there is the roads. This is the first map which shows the roads. Look, New, Newtown Barry or Bunclody is actually mentioned on the map, but it's nowhere as feel at that stage. And under Bunclody, you can see Mount Leinster, Leinster uh, indicating the way it was pronounced, Mount Leinster uh, at that stage. But what I'm, what I'm interested in is the roads which converge on Clonigal. Clonigal had a bridge, Bunclody didn't. Because of that, Clonigal was the important place. And if you look, you can see the road then going from Clonigal and uh, it goes up to Tullow. Tola, and then on to Carlo. The other road then is coming from Tinnehealy. And then interestingly too, the, the other road crosses uh, on, a, on the Derry and then on the Slaney, not on a bridge, but on two ferries, on two um, um, fording points. They're still there actually, uh, just where the bridge is at Kildown, but you have to cross uh, first on the Derry and then across the uh, Slaney. But the really interesting thing too is the old road, which is still there, goes from Clonigal up over Banastraw and then drops down to Clahaman and then the road from Clahaman goes to Enniscorthy on the other side of the Slane. Doesn't go on where the road now goes, which uh, once the bridge was formed in Bunclody. But, but the whole nucleus of the roads is to Clonigal, but nothing going through the mountains. If we take the next one, we can see the same thing with Mohurry, because the only road going through the Black Stairs um, was obviously through the Skull of Gap. Um, and Mohori, which you can see there, the Duffery Hall, the famous Coakley um, territory, is there. Mohori is like Clonigal. Look, the, the roads converge on the road from Enniscorthy, which still goes up through the crossroads there, uh, Enniscorthy going to uh, Kilkenny, and then the road heading down along the southern Black Stairs, heading for New Ross. But just look at how many roads are converging there on Mohori, but uh, only one to the heart of the mountains. And that's what made the Skull of Gap and so important. Next one, Robert. So, Bunclody and is very late on the scenes. I've said already about mountains that they resisted um, the state, that it was hard to control mountains. Mountains produced very individualist people who are used to doing things their own way. And mountains are hard to control, hard to conquer, hard to keep under your, your kind of thumb. And until well into the late 18th century, Mountains across Europe were not widely regarded. Nowadays, we love mountains. We love their wildness. We love uh, what we think of as the beauty of them, and they are beautiful, okay? But until the late 18th century, that aesthetic sense we have of them wasn't there. People hated mountains, hated them, thought of them as rogues and robbers and bears and wolves and things that went a bump in the night. Read the grim fairy tales. The grim fairy tales are absolutely full of horrible stories of what happened to you when you leave the beaten track and go into the mountains. But it's only in the late 18th century that the ideas of mountains are beautiful and that they create a lovely backdrop for towns or big houses or whatever. It's only then that that comes in. This is Charles Valency's map of uh, Bunclody in 1776 when Bunclody was beginning to get going. And the next one shows uh, the way the mountains were seen. Now look at this, this is uh, Bunclody with its very fine Protestant church. This is from 1795, okay? But what I want to kind of emphasize is, look at the way the mountains are shown. This is from a book published by Jonathan Fisher in 1795. And it's the first time that you see the idea that mountains are picturesque and beautiful and create an elegant backdrop for a town. But what you can also see is something else, is it's not very realistic, is it? because the, the Black Stairs are granite mountains, so they're domed. They're all uh, lovely um, uh, circles and flows and curves. There's not an angular or peaked about them. But the thing that had spiked this interest in mountains was the Alps, especially on the Grand Tour. So Fisher deliberately makes the mountains look uh, very angular and tall and alpine, as opposed to the gently rounded and very elegant curves of the, the Black Stairs. Okay, I'll take the next one there, Robert. 
Now, now this territory, as I say, really only one road through it. This is the aerial photograph showing the famous uh, Skolo Gap. This is it um, as shown by Google two or three years ago. But if you follow the, the road pattern there, you can see the track um, as, the, um, as it goes on there towards Rahana. Uh, you can see all the, um, the, the little houses and farms along the side of the mountain. And then if you look at Gill's map from 1807, the next one there, yeah, this is the, you know, exactly the same road shown there, as I said, going through from uh, Mohori and the, the Coakley of Duffery Hall there, down in Ken Hemingway country, um, in the Duffery, uh, going up to uh, what is now Kiltini and then out to Rahana. But it's exactly the same road. But what, I'm, what, is, uh, what I want to kind of emphasize here is this is a good source for car lot that people don't know about because the, uh, Valentine, this is Valentine Gill's map of County Wexford. And there's a very good version of it online on the Trinity College website. But uh, it's got very good representation as well of um, the Carlo side of the mountain, which you mightn't expect. But anyway, Skullo Gap, really important, became very important uh, as well in 1798. Next one there, Robert, please. Because um, again, 1798 is a, something I've spent a long time uh, researching and writing about, so I'm not going to bang on about it too much uh, tonight. But what I do want to draw your attention to is the fact that during 1798, the two areas that were latest to be controlled were the Wicklow Mountains and the Blackstairs. And the, the famous um, Cody and Corcoran uh, duo, Joseph Cody, who was a Protestant um, uh, from Bunclody, and uh, James Corcoran, um, who came from over uh, the Ballandagan side of the, the, the mountains. Uh, they were able to hold out, uh, hop it back there for a sec, Robert. Uh, they were able to hold out in the Blackstairs all the way through until 1804. So for six years, six years after 1798, with thousands and thousands of troops, with murder and mayhem and battles uh, all around, these two, these lads and their, their gang, as they were called, the Cochrane Cody gang, managed to survive in a very daring kind of way all along the back stairs. If you look at this is um, uh, a reward money poster, like the Wild West, uh, issued by General Henniker from Carlo town, um, in 1801, and it lists and gives details of who all these uh, guys were. Now, I'm not going to go through that in detail, but the, uh, the interesting point about it is the vast bulk of them were Wexford lads, but there were four uh, from um, Carlow. The four Carlow guys uh, were Francis Hayden from Ballyshin Carra, which is in Kildavan, as you, many of you would know, and then uh, the three Burns, Patrick Byrne, Edmund Byrne, two Burns, and John Kelly. Patrick Byrne, Edmund Byrne, and John Kelly, who had escaped with Corcoran from Carlo Jail. But it's a remarkable exercise. Why are they able to survive so long? Well, basically because they moved around the mountain with ease, and the young men and the army were very afraid to go next, nigh, or near them while they were on the mountain. It's that same old fear. The guys are sitting up there. They know what way you're coming. They know the mountain like the back of their hand. And you were having to try to get off, get horses or whatever up the rocks and the no roads, nothing like that. And it's a remarkable thing, isn't it? That for six years, a gang of fairly, as we might think, ordinary Wexford and Carlow guys were able to turn their noses at the British Army and everybody else who, um, who came that way. Now, they weren't just, you know, rogues and robbers. Uh, Walter Kavanagh of Boris House, who tried hard to catch them, said that they were never criminals. They maintained cordial relationships uh, with the locals. Um, and uh, the locals kind of uh, knew not to kind of uh, say too much. But what is interesting is, from the military point of view, it was seen as a disaster. <coughs> Henniker said, this district is formed as if by its nature to conceal them, the district being the Blackstairs, formed as if by nature to conceal them and lacking a great road to intersect the fastness makes it a rallying point for the disaffected. And of course, Michael Dwyer and his men were able to do the same thing in uh, Wexford. Um, and Henniker concluded that the absence of roads allowed the ill-disposed sufficient time to prepare for any soldier sense against them, and consequently, they were too well uh, secreted. Um, it's a remarkable um, exercise. 
Because even when they offered significant amount of money, that, that proclamation there was offering 200 guineas each for uh, Cody and Corcoran. Even still, the local people uh, never uh, gave them up. And even though they were kind of pushed around and had to go as far as Kilkenny and rob the mail coach at Mundabat and all that, uh, Mundabat and South Kilkenny, they survived very well there. Eventually pushed out. Cody disappears. I think he may have ended up in America, but I'd love to know what happened to him. Corcoran and his companion, John Fitzpatrick, the Hessian, another Buntlody man, were eventually caught up with in Clockram Woods, which is near Enniscorthy. And this is this famous um, illustration of their last stand, because even when they were uh, shot and wounded, they fought to the, uh, the very, very last. So again, just uh, my point here is how long uh, the mountains last, how long the mountains provide refuge for guys like this. Um, and, you know, the skull gap, I'll come back to that again, uh, is a remarkable phenomenon. Like the, the description of one of the great descriptions of 1798, to my way of looking at it, is by the, the Carla man, David Byrne. He was a member of the uh, Lachlan Bridge Yeomanry, a Catholic yeoman, but he went to America and he wrote a book under the pseudonym Hibernicus or Irishman about the 1798 rebellion. It's actually one of the best books about 1798 in Carlo. But one of the things he talks about uh, was seeing the rebel army moving through the Skull Oak Gap. And it's not the way you would think. You'd think they'd be moving fast. They were moving very, very slowly. They had women and children with them. They had cattle with them. And the, the army was afraid to go near them. It's a remarkable thing. And he describes this slow passage of this kind of tide of Wexford rebels passing through the Skull Oak Gap uh, with the army afraid uh, to go, as I say, next night or near. Okay, um, now at this stage too, um, we have uh, the um, maps, as I said earlier, from uh, 1807 by Valentine Gill. I'm just going to show you three of them, uh, which show the Carlo side of the equation. This is the one showing Temple Ludigan across to uh, St. Mullins with the White Mountain running off there to the, to the um, north. I'll take the next one, Robert. Uh, the second one shows from Greg Namana down to uh, St. Mullins, and again uh, up along uh, from Drana there and, and Glen up along the side of the, of the White Mountain. And the last one is of uh, the area across from Burris over towards the Skull of Gap, uh, shows really well the village there of Kiledman, shows the beginnings of uh, Ballymurphy. Again, just nice detail on those maps and not all that well known as, as I say, as a, a Carlo uh, source. Okay, next one there. Right, now let's come back to the Black Stairs. This marvelous map, at least I think it's a marvelous map, was done by the uh, geographer T.W. Freeman. Um, and it shows the domains, they're in black, the domains, the, the, the gardens and the landscape uh, properties uh, around the big houses uh, in uh, South Leinster in the 1840s. This is from the first edition Ordnance Survey map. Now, what is striking about that is you can see the Wicklow Mountains there down to the uh, bottom corner are the Black Stairs. What's striking about that is in Wicklow, the Black Stairs Valley, uh, the, the glens of Wicklow are all on the eastern side. There's wonderful landscapes on the eastern side of the Wicklows, which were ideal for big domains, you have Powers Court and all, you know, Shelton Abbey, all those down along the way. Uh, interesting, you don't have the same thing along the Black Stairs. The biggest one in the Black Stairs is the one in the bottom left-hand corner, which is Burris Domain, just over to the, uh, about half an inch to the left there, Robert, and the bottom left, there you go, right there, that's Burris there. And then you've got a few along the Wexford side, and I'm gonna show you Monk's Grange in a moment or two up on the slopes of the mountain. But nowhere near as many as are, are along the Wicklow one. Why is that? Because the geology of the Wicklow Mountains and the Wexford, the Blackstairs Mountains is very different. In Wicklow, you had, I'm sorry to get technical and geological on you, but I did do geography in college. The, uh, you have in Wicklow what's called the metamorphic aureole, A-U-R-E-O-L-E, -E, expand your vocabulary. Aureole means a ring. Uh, when the, the granite pushes up, it pushes up like a blister. Um, and the heat of the magma burns or solidifies all the rocks, uh, metamorphoses them, changes them on either side. So you get what's called a metamorphic aureole. It's a thin rim around the mountain. 
but it, it's very, very hard baked and therefore spectacular. That's where you get the waterfalls like Powers Court and whatever, creates a very dramatic landscape. Now that didn't happen in Wexford. In Wexford, the, the granite came up, the magma came up much more gently and it never had that kind of baking effect. So in the, in the black stairs, there's quite a gentle, rounded, curved, almost feminine kind of aspect to the uh, black stairs, whereas the Wicklow Mountains, especially their east facing side, are very, very uh, rugged. Okay, uh, hit it again there, Robert. So, uh, and here's, here's the, the Wexford side, and this is looking up from the village of Ratnure, which is down in the left-hand corner there, Chapel Village, um, and then up above, high, very high, up, six, up over 600 feet, is Monk's Grange to me. This wonderful photograph was taken in 1960, uh, 1963 by the great military photographer, uh, Joseph, um, uh, uh, Keith St. Joseph, who flew in a little Cessna plane uh, around Ireland, took a wonderful set of photographs. They're all online now in the Cambridge University Geography Department, which is brilliant. There's a wonderful set of photographs there from all over Ireland, including many from Wexford and Carlow. But I love this one because he flew very low in that little plane. Most aerial photographs are up too high. You can't really see him. But this is a wonderful photograph as you're approaching Ratnure and looking up at Monk's Grange Domain, perched high up there on the mountain. But this is also 1963 before all the modern fad for removing uh, fields and fences and all of that kind of stuff. So you still have very intact there, essentially the 19th century farming landscape of uh, Wexford. And what I also want to kind of point out there is what's up above Monk's Grange, which is the reclamation lands uh, just on the, on the slopes of the mountain. That's up to eight or 900 feet. And the settlement and the, was pushing right up to the top of the mountains. And um, next one there, Robert. And that was to do as well with the new um, developments that occurred in Ireland with the advent of the potato. Now, I'm not going to go into this in any detail. I've written extensively about it elsewhere. But if you don't understand this, you won't understand the Blackstairs, which is the potato. The potato allowed for colonization of rough land. If you look at the down survey maps, and compare them with the first edition Ordnance Survey maps. The down survey maps, give or take, 1660s, the Ordnance Survey maps, 1840s. So let's say in two centuries. In two centuries, in Ireland, if you look at the settlement, the settlement moved up and the farming moved up from 400 feet to 800 feet. Before that, if you, once you hit 400 feet, you stopped uh, any kind of tillage. But with the potato, the potato allowed farming to creep up the mountains, to push up field by field, one generation reclaimed some fields, the next generation reclaimed more, and they were going farther and farther up the mountain. But with the potato driving it, the potato is almost a perfect food if you add a little bit of milk and salt. Uh, that allowed for um, early marriage, it allowed for a demographic explosion. The more people you had in the mountain, the better, the more land you could reclaim. And the, here's Ranagira in Michel Parish. Uh, this is from the first edition of the survey map. Now, what I want to kind of point out is, up to the right hand corner there is these little settlements. It wasn't that you had, and there's another one there just in the middle of the photograph. It wasn't that you had each farmer outstanding in his own field as it were, the way we have today where there's separate farms and each farm is like its own little micro republic. In, the, in this pattern of settlement, what happened was people got together and then they managed a lot of things commonly. You didn't own land as it were. What you did was you owned shares in a setup. So if there was 350 acres and there was 10 families, each of you would have not quite 35 acres, but each of you would have one tenth of the turf bog, one tenth of the grazing rights on the commonage. And look, if you look to the right there around the area, you're heading up onto the mountain. Now I talked earlier about uh, the, the um, Goulian and the cattle grazing on the mountains. These were crucially in the Gaelic system, they were commonage. They weren't owned by one individual. They were owned by a group of families, a townland, basically. Often these families, too, were kin related. You might have, um, you know, initially one or two families there, and eventually it ends up maybe four, five, 10, 15, 20. And all along this left hand side, the, the uh, western side of the Black Stairs, if you look in parishes of Ballymurphy and Michael, up in the top of Kilbranish, all those areas along there. 
they all have that settlement pattern. And it's a remarkable story how literally with the spade, they handmade a landscape. We all love handmade things now. The Irish landscape, the Blackstairs landscape of this time is a handmade landscape. It's made with the spade. It's made with blood, sweat and tears. Why were people willing to do it? They were willing to do it because it gave them freedom. The, the landlords liked people going up in the mountain. It reclaimed the land. They let them off for the first 10 years or so. Then they started making them pay rent. They made more money from these people's willingness to do all this uh, really, really hard work. But it pushed up. So the potato was hugely important. Reclamation was hugely important. They had ways of doing it. They used to burn. They'd dig the soil, then they'd burn it and use that as a kind of a manure for the first crop. Um, they also had, as I say, these partnership leases. Instead of one person having the lease, a group of farmers would get together and take the lease as a whole. And that meant all the pressure didn't fall on one guy. Um, and then they had what geographers technically call clockens, these group villages. But they're not villages in the sense that we think of villages nowadays. No shop, no church, nothing in them except the houses. And these houses are, again, what we would now love. They were sustainable houses. They were built with the rocks of the mountain. They were uh, attached with the grass or sometimes the straw, if they could get it. The floor was a, a mud floor. I was born in a mud floored house, clay floored house, nothing wrong with it. <laughs> Very fine floor in many ways. Much softer to the foot when you stick your foot out of the bed than a bloody uh, cold, chilly tile, let me tell you. But anyway, the clay floor, and then crucially, you had everything you needed. You had the turf. In Ireland, many are cold, but few are frozen. A turf fire will keep you going. Um, in the winter, you can get the turf on the mountain as well. You have the potato then, which is, as I said earlier, a very fine um, uh, diet, perfect, really. Vegetarian, as we would now say. These guys were vegans before anybody knew what the hell that was. But let me tell you what happened. The population of Ireland was 16, in 1600 was 1 million, in 1700 was 2 million, in 1800 was 4 million, in, on the eve of the famine in the 1840s, it was 8 million. It had doubled in two centuries and had then doubled again between 1800 and 1840. Now that's incredible growth. And if you're looking at what, where it went, it wasn't growth in the cities. It was growth on the sides of the mountains. And one thing that Ireland is not short of is mountains. It's a remarkable story. Now, um, when we look at the mountain, what do we think of? You know, we think of these, uh, well, I do anyway. Um, I'm a Wexford man, so you'll forgive me for pointing out here the Wexford colours, the purple and gold. But the furs there, the furs is really important. The Irish proverb says, or a, a free action which means gold under the furs. If furs will grow, you can grow potatoes. If you get rid of the furs, burn it out. The Kerry farmers still burn it um, every uh, summer, as far as I can see, even though it's illegal. Uh, you know, that and the header, the header, which is a, a, the classic mountain pla uh, plant. How beautiful is that? But the, the, the reclamation goes under that, and once furs will grow, the potatoes are, are fine in that territory. Next one there, Robert. Okay. Um, but you need, again, getting rid of furs is not a, a job for a chap, as my father would have said, uh, back to the first thing there. Uh, you know, you need, you need it to be tough. Uh, you, none of you may have ever seen what this is before, but let me tell you what that is. That's a sugon rope, which has been turned into what was called a furs glove. Because if you were clearing furs, furs is really prickly, really prickly. And it's prickly all year round, 365 days a year. Okay, so you want to kind of stick your hand in there and start cutting it with a bill hook or something. You better be well protected. And this is this is what they used. They came up with the a sugon glove, a glove made out of a, a straw rope, very carefully wrapped around the hand, and away you go. And then if you look at the next slide, which is, I believe, anyway, um, Tommy Murphy or somebody will shoot me if I'm wrong, but uh, down in Michel, I think this is the tip of Kulnishnachta. And what you can see there very beautifully is what I was saying that the way the the settlement comes up the mountains, field by field, intake by intake, and then you've got that sharp edge between the mountain proper and the, the lowland. Uh, but in Ireland, you see that everywhere. Go to Kerry, 
go to Connemara, go to Donegal, look on the sides of the mountain, and almost everywhere you will see the ridges, the ghosts of the ridges in which the potatoes were grown. But that's how the population of Ireland increased, and that's how the mountains were uh, conquered. And next one there, Robert. So, who, oh, the bane of my young life were these guys. Uh, these are black faced mountain sheep. I couldn't bear to show uh, ones from Wicklow. They're uh, impossible to keep in a field. Uh, mountain sheep are rare to be wild and they will get out of any field known to man. My father uh, bought lots of these bloody things. Um, he was what they used to call a jobber, you know, bought and sold, job lots of these. My, my neighbor Sam Deacon used to call them jumble sale uh, sheep. But uh, when my father would bring them to Punt to the fair, we, we were a big family. We were used as the kind of sheep dogs, but try to fit and keep them guys from going in, uh, the neighbor's fields are going down a lane or a boring or whatever it was tough work let me tell you so every time i see those sheep i'm uh, under my breath i'm slightly um annoyed by them but i think they're very beautiful and very hardy animals as well the sheep come too but they're later it's in the 19th century it's a post famine that the sheep come and that's when the landlords begin to get interested when you can fatten sheep on the mountain now they're not so keen on all these little small farmers or micro farmers with their potatoes on the edge of the mountains they want to get rid of them next one there Robert. Um, and okay, I'll just come back to the sheep. Now, what happens when you come to the sheep then is the farmers now are seen as surplus to requirement. They're seen as little micro farmers, very poor um, cottiers or, you know, just the poorest of the poor, the lowest of the low. And the idea is get rid of them. And the great tragedy of the Blackstairs is the clearances, and that's all one can call them, the clearances that occurred on the southern Blackstairs in the area around uh, Ballymurphy in particular in the 1830s and 40s, just on the eve of the famine. And again, what is tragic is that a series of landlords had managed to get their hands on uh, property there. And what they did essentially was to try to get rid of as many people as they could, as quickly as they could. And it all happened basically in the late 1830s, early 1890s. Uh, Knock Row on the Newton estate, Coonog on the Court Town estate, the Wexford landlords, very bad crowd were the Court Towns at that stage. Ballynatton, which was owned by Sir Simon Bradstreet, a Dublin lawyer, and then Kilcloney, which was on the Beresford, the Beresford estate from Curramore in Waterford. But on those estates, many people were removed. There's brilliant and heartbreaking, savage descriptions of the court town evictions in 1840 at Kuno, when no fewer than 42 families and 250 individuals were evicted, only seven families left, and a thousand soldiers and police, soldiers and police sent with pickaxes, spades, shovels to remove these people and use all force necessary if possible, flatten their houses and burn them to the ground. Horrific. And the, the same in Kilcloney, 17 families, 79 individuals, four families of Doyles, four of Keeleys, two of Careys, the Cabinets, the Keegans, the Ryan, the Dwyer, the Comerford, the MacDonald, and the inevitable uh, Wheeling. In Kuno, where we have fantastically detailed descriptions, you know, we had three families of Redmonds, four of Swords, two of the Wilkinsons, two Drelands, two Blanchels, two Doyles, two Murphys, and Houlihan's Crane, Lawler, Cox, Connor, and then the widow Summers, the widow MacDonald, the widow Norris, and the widow Whelan, 85 years old and turfed out into the side of a ditch. Literally. You know, so like if you think of it, those townlands are very close together. Uh, Knockrow, Coonog, Ballynatton, Kilcloney. Literally hundreds of families removed. Some of them managed them to make their way to the US, but literally, one day you're in the house, the next day you're literally in a ditch. And you know, the, 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 the problem here was these guys, the sheep, because the landlords now thought that as in Scotland, they'd be better off to get rid of all these small farmers and put in a few big sheep ranchers and that would make them money and you'd be better off uh, like that. And of course the locals weren't gonna kind of take that uh, uh, line down because what was also happening here was what you might call the privatization of the landscape, as we would now say. But these, these were also landlords trying to muscle in on common issues. They had no rights to the common age. Legally, they were under English common law. They belonged to the 
the people, not to the landlords, but now they managed to persuade the British government to allow them, as with the enclosures in England, to allow them to privatise these and to claim them as their own private property. And you get these running battles on the White Mountain, on Bantry Commons, uh, on, in St Mullins, in Temple Udigan. The lads in Temple Udigan were particularly good at resisting um, all this. But you get uh, huge efforts to um, evict these guys and you get massive uh, rows and ructions and whatever. But it's the saddest, it's the saddest episode in the history of the Black Stairs. Now I'm coming towards an end because I know we have to watch on the time. Um, what I also just want to talk about now a little bit is the early 20th century. Um, one of the other things that the, the mountains have, crucially, is the frockens. Just back there for a sec. These are uh, what Americans would call blueberries, what other people call bilberries. If you were from Tipperary, you might call them hearts. Um, some parts of America, they're known as huckleberries. Uh, you'll all have heard of huckleberry fin. And the uh, huckleberry was, uh, you know, that's a name for a frocken, as we would call them. But huckleberries were also associated with poor people. They were poor people's food. So, you know, the very fact that he's called Huckleberry Finn, he's Irish as well, by the way, Tim Twain says he has, he's an Irish guy um, um, in America, Irish American, but Huckleberry Finn, even the name there is giving you a clue as to what background uh, he's from. But here, nowadays, these things are as popular as, I was gonna say an inelegant word, really, really popular. They're full of all kinds of stuff that the, uh, that uh, trendy kind of uh, food people uh, really, really like. They're brilliantly good for so many uh, ways. So, uh, you know, they're, they're enjoying a massive uh, revival. But the, the frockens grew, not interestingly, on the Wexford side, but on the Carla side of the Blackstairs. And the best townland by far for frockens was Kuno, the townland I just talked about as having been savagely cleared in the 1840s. But especially in the period from uh, the First World War and the Second World War, there was huge demand for these because they were used as a um, manufacturer in dyes, they were used for flavoring in wines, they were used as essences for preserves and jams, um, and they were very, very popular. They, they ripen in the six weeks during July and the first two weeks of August. But from about 1917 until the 1950s, the frocken harvest uh, down around Ballymurphy and Rahanna was a major source of uh, income. And, uh, you know, people from Greg Namana and even from Tipperary came across uh, to uh, pick them. Uh, next one there, Robert. So, you know, this is uh, Margaret Dorn from Walshestown in Ballymurphy pointing out uh, where you could pick the frockens up on the top of the mountain there. What a lovely uh, photograph. Um, and here's another man, um, Tommy. Uh, Tommy Coleman is on the joint table. This is... Um, uh, over in uh, Rahana. Uh, some of you might remember that gentleman. But uh, what I want to kind of point here, next one is there's a marvelous book about this uh, written by Michael J. Connery. Um, and it's about picking bilberries, frockens, and hurts in Ireland. A really fine book. I'd recommend it to you. And it's got a great section in it on the, the San Carlo um, uh, situation. Okay, uh, coming towards an end now, guys. Uh, next one. I want to kind of finish by talking about. The potential of the mountain. You know, sometimes in Ireland you can think we have too much history. And sometimes you can say, okay, what about the present? Now, I don't ever want to reduce mountains or anything else in our landscape to a merely utilitarian dimension. But one thing I do know is this, that you only lose things if you don't love them enough. And I love the mountains. And I love what the possibilities of the mountains are, the future of the mountain, just as much as the past. And part of that is this, have we learned anything in lockdown? Well, I tell you one thing that maybe we have learned is how valuable nature is to it as a therapeutic, as a healing thing, as a way of coping with the stress of a, a major pandemic like uh, COVID. But also what we have learned maybe in recent um, years, look at Australia, biblical fires one year, and in the exact same place as biblical floods now and plagues of mice and millions and millions of spiders invading people's homes, right? You know, it's global warming. You know, we've got to wake up here now and smell the, the coffee or the cappuccino or the cup of tea or whatever, right? There's a massive challenge that faces us now. But part of that is learning about what I would call sustainability. And that comes to treating the landscape 
uh, well. The previous slide there was shown, um, you know, just the foraging, which is now major league uh, thing. You know, learning uh, who picks frockens anymore, and yet like they're brilliant. But maybe we should go back to those kind of things. Um, you know, and the Blackstairs uh, is great for that. The next one there shows one of the big mistakes we made in the past. And I'm going to say something controversial now. But uh, we, in this country, we planted uh, very large proportions of the mountains with conifers. And it was the biggest waste of time, money, effort, and imagination ever. Look at this here on the slopes of the Blackstairs. I hate those dark, gloomy conifers. I hate their straight lines. I hate the way they're out of sympathy with the landscape. Those things never grew on those mountains until we as a state decided to do it in the 1920s. Get rid of them. They're a waste of space, literally. So like, I think we need now to be much cleverer about how we deal with the landscape and not introduce alien species of uh, this kind, which have added no economic value whatsoever. We can't even give the wood away uh, now. Okay, and in the same way, I think we're facing the similar thing here. These are, um, you know, controversial now on the Blackstairs. Um, and everybody has a different view about these, but like, I don't like the industrial um, look of um, wind uh, mills like that, and especially wind farms. I think they've wrecked the very beautiful valley uh, when you come into Kildavan. Now, when I come down into Kildavan, when you come around the corner down into Kildavan, you've got that marvelous valley in front of you. And now all I can see is these damn metallic things up in front of you. These are what I would call the same as what I was talking about earlier with the, the landlords privatizing the commons. This is again, private business inserting themselves into a land or a landscape that we all own and a view that we all love. And you know, there's places you can put them. There's nobody more in favor of clean energy than I am. But like we in Ireland are lucky because we've got all those sandbanks off Wexford. You can put hundreds, thousands, if you need them, wind farms out there and nobody will even see them. Okay, great, put that, but there's no need whatsoever to be putting them on our mountains and destroying uh, what is such a beautiful resource, what is such a historic resource and such a part of the story of who we are. If I wanna kind of say, what kind of a person am I? Okay, many other people give you different opinions, but like I would always kind of think of myself as a mountainy man in a way. Um, and I would think, you know, that the culture that we've endure, uh, evolved and this is uh, top marks to whoever uh, did this logo. I love it, the Mount Leinster Rangers. Whoever did that um, deserves a huge amount of credit. But uh, you know, and I, I said earlier there about the South Carlo being an area of tradition. The hurling is really strong there and Mount Leinster Rangers have been a brilliant club in recent years. And I take my hat off. In some ways, they're the true heroes, the true champions of hurling. It's easy to play if they're gonna win all Ireland or whatever. It's great to play for the love of the game and to play at a high standard as Mount Leinster Rangers have done. But we need, you know, you're not going to have teams if you don't have people. So, you know, I sometimes think when we talk about sustainability in Ireland, and I know when somebody like me starts talking about it, um, you know, uh, people will instantly say, what about jobs? What about the future? What about uh, this? And I think, like, the sustainability of people has to come first. So, like, it's not just a case of conserving the, uh, the, the landscape or conserving nature or conserving the birds, all of which I'm totally in favor of. It's also about making sure that the people who live in these beautiful communities, who live along the Black Stairs, that those people and their children have a genuine and legitimate future as well. And we are lucky in Ireland because we still have essentially a relatively intact rural culture. That's no longer the case in large parts of Europe. Large parts of rural Europe in Spain, in Italy, in France, have been abandoned. And I would hate to think that we would allow that to happen in Ireland. But I think we now need to shift, like a paradigm shift, in terms of how we think about this. Because in the past, we thought about um, fields and farms and as being about food production. And, you know, if we could fertilize the hell out of it and dig drains and knock out ditches, you know, as much as we could produce food, we were heroes. And again, like, I don't want to diminish that at all. But what I do want to kind of say is, Guys, there is, and girls, and lads, and lasses, or some non-gender language, people, there's a change coming. The big investment over the next 20 years is going to be in sustainability. It's going to be in greening uh, the economy. It's going to be in greening food production. So we need to change 
from Irish farming being dedicated to the interests of the major producers to being Irish farming as something that sustains rural communities. And we need to change our attitudes to food. We need to change our attitudes that there is somehow a, a, a gap or a chasm between people who support environment and people who are wanting to support rural communities and jobs and whatever. We need to band together on this. There's huge grants and huge possibilities. And we need to kind of think about this. One of the other things we've learned from lockdown is that it may now be quite conceivable if we have good quality broadband, which is what I'd be pushing on, Everybody should now have access to um, good broadband. It's a fundamental human right. But if you have that and you're a creative kind of person or you can work from home or whatever, who wouldn't like to be looking out at the Black Stars? And it can be an immense source of um, inspiration. Look at this. This is a, a great uh, Spanish photographer called Louis Rodriguez who came to Ratnur in Wexford of all places. And it is uh, weird, quirky, in some ways strangely compelling photographs. This is of... Uh, this is of um, a young woman um, in Ratnior with her dancing costume, but he got her to put the other one on over her kind of head. And it creates that incredible image. He also did, made the uh, horrors do amazing kind of uh, moves as well. It's called the mud people because it got a, the impression that Wexford means, you know, wise ford means mud, the mud ford or the mud people. So it's called the, the, the mud people, but it's a beautiful book and you can get it. Uh, you can get it online if you're interested. But like, you know, like, look at that. Amazing, isn't it? What, like in Ratnur. Um, but that's a top, like there's a, there was a 10 page article in the New Yorker, my source of, a, uh, you know, cultural uh, kudos about this uh, photographer. He's a world-class photographer, but he found something really of interest in Ratnur on the slopes of the Black Star. Next one there, Robert. And coming to an end now, guys, um, what I also want to kind of say is that my, um, if I had a hat, <laughs> I've had hair, um, my hat goes off to the people in the communities who look after their heritage. Look at this. This, this is in my own parish over in Barrack, Cranavon, Holywell. Now, the, the local families who look after that graveyard and the people who have done that, look at what a beautiful job they've done on it. This is from about two years ago, I think. But just, uh, you know, the, 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 the daffodils, the way it's cared for, the sense of uh, connection with the past and the sense that, uh, you know, people care about their heritage. You know, that's, to me, like, that's what makes Ireland Ireland. And that's what makes me proud that when I look at that image now, it makes me proud of being from the parish of Clonigal. It really does. Okay, and I'll finish with, um, you know, the Miss Covered Mountain, really important, lovely so uh, tune in the Irish. You know, the mountains are not the same thing, are they? Um, I've had the, the privilege and maybe the, the luxury of traveling across a lot of the globe. But when you come back to Ireland, what you realize is we have one of the most magnificent landscapes in the world. And a large part of it is because it's so changeable. You can go to the Black Stairs a thousand times. It will never look exactly the same because of the change of the clouds. We have the most dynamic sky in the world above our heads. And we get these beautiful things in the morning, like the scarf of of mist, the pink mist just below uh, the mountain. How beautiful is that? Okay, and the, the next one. I'll be making myself cry in a minute. The bluebells growing on the, on the bare mountain at the Black Stairs. Again, the eternal recurrence. The bluebells don't suffer from COVID. They come up every summer. They're a gift that is given to us. And I'll finish with, you know, my image of the Black Stairs. Um, when I was a child, I used to hear about these things called starlings, and we call them Black Stairs. And it was only when I was in my 20s, perhaps I was a slow learner, that I suddenly made the uh, connection that what we call black stairs were what other people called starlings, because they came from the black stairs down to Clonigal or Kildavan, where, where I grew, uh, grew up. But that's my image of the black stairs. You see, the, the name is wrong, isn't it? Because it's Nastira Dua. But do in, in the Irish, that means purple. It means uh, a dark, dark, dark blue, not black stairs. It should be called the purple stairs. Purple is the really the color of the Black Stairs. And every evening I used to love looking when the sun went behind the Black Stairs and you got this deepening purple glow that came off the mountain. And, and that to me, you know, if you don't like that, you won't like Ireland. It's the, green, it's the palette of Ireland, the green of the land. And I'm gonna erase them fecking conifers out of the picture. But the, the green of the land, the blue of the mountains, and then the, the soft blue of the sky above it. And that mountain has been there 
It's been there before us, it'll be there after us. Mountains endure. And there's something wonderful in Ireland, which is that very seldom, if you lift your head, very seldom anywhere you are in Ireland that there isn't a mountain on the horizon. We're an island of scattered um, island mountains, which is a wonderful thing. But it's that, you know, we're on the lowlands, but we lift our eyes. Through some corda, as it says in the good book, you know, lift up your heart. And, uh, you know, in every culture, it's that sense that when you come to the mountains, you come to the essentials of life. You, come, you enter out of time, which is the human life or clock time, and you enter into eternity, the things which have been there forever, the things which have been there before you and there after you. And to me, the black stairs are one of the great symbols of eternity. And uh, having traveled, as I say, the globe, every time I come back into um, Wexford and Carlow and Wicklow, which is my uh, homeland, um, every time I come back, I say, I grew up in a, a place that is as beautiful and as enriching and as soul nourishing as anywhere on the planet. Thank you very much. Kevin, where do I start? Um, I put it this way, if I was to even look at the comments coming through on Facebook and coming through in the chat, the talk about passion, inspirational, wonderful, excellent, um, educational, great presentation, informative. Um, the numbers are higher than we've ever had, about 164. Um, the people being from Peru, as far as Australia, listening to you. Um, and I think it sums up with one person, but they're lonely from home. Um, it's been a fantastic lecture, uh, and I'll open it to the floor for questions. Okay, we're taking questions through, um, through, the, through the chat function. Um, we can't take them in, in person. I have a few questions here for you, Kevin. Yeah. Um, Barry Dalby is asking about um, what's the earliest reference for the, for, to the, black, the name the Black Stairs Mountains, I suppose. When did it come into, into use? And also then George Quirk had a, a related question as well. Uh, Loch Ligon um, for Mount Leicester, what are the origins of that name? And I think you've I probably answered this already, but is that the earliest name you found for Mount Leinster? Yeah, I mean, now uh, I should have my, my, uh, my uh, friend, um, Kahuro Kruliak, who's the actual expert some place names in Wexford, who's done the hard work on this, which I wouldn't have. But I, I've been looking lately, and I definitely think that Mount Leinster, as that name, only comes in in the 16th, 17th century. Um, it was called definitely Stua Lion, uh, S-T-U-A, which means a kind of a, a peak, but Stua Lion uh, before that. Um, uh, but I am going to look more carefully now, um, you know, because sometimes uh, you take these things for granted. Uh, but I do think it marks that transition where you're moving from the Irish language culture into the English language, or English language one. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with Mount Leinster, except it's a lie, isn't it? Because Logan Akilla is hired and uh, we have to let the Wicklow lads uh, win something. <laughs> I was once on a, on a, a very, uh, one of the saddest days of my life. I was coming back up from uh, Turles, where um, we had been beaten by Cork when, when we played three uh, National League finals in a row just lost in the last minute. We should have won it. Uh, Martin Story scored a winning point and the ref called it back and picking um, uh, John O'Connor, the father of Rory and Jack, and the current Wexford team, missed the, the 70. He should have given the point. We would have won the damn thing. But I, I was very feeling very morose and sad on it and there was a, a very drunk Wicklow guy uh, beside me on the train. And then every five minutes he used to shout out, Wicklow, the biggest county in Ireland if it was flattened out. <laughs> he kind of, he took my uh, mind off. But anyway, Wicklow would be, Wicklow uh, would be the biggest county in Ireland if it was flattened, flattened out. But Mount Leinster, it's a, it's, a, it's a lovely name. But sometimes the older names are, to me, more evocative and more rooted uh, uh, way back into it. Uh, the earliest reference, and I'll just give you this because I, I did skip over it, but uh, it's interesting. It's in the life of, of uh, Nave Moog. Moog, Aidan, our patron saint in the Diocese of Parents, Mo A O, my little A or my little Aiden. Isn't that a, a remarkable name? It can be Aiden, it can be Moog, it can be um, uh, Moses, because they're translated that way as well. And the same guy could be called Aiden Kavanagh, Moses Kavanagh, or Moog Kavanagh. But all from the, the confusions that arise from uh, transitioning from one language to another. We live in the aftermath of a language, really. Um, but my point about that is, um, here's uh, the, the, the life of St. Mo. This is from the 10th century. And in that, 
he talks about the four corners of Ireland. And one of the corners that he that the hagiographer gives, one of the corners is um, what he calls the celebrated hill of Lyon, Canuck Lyon, goes me in one place there. The four corners of Ireland are from Kells to Bundrus. That's um, uh, uh, Bundrus is uh, up uh, near modern day um, Bundoran. Kells in me to Bundrus to Mount Leinster and from the Ireland to the Shannon. So, you know, that's the earliest reference I've seen to Canuck Lyon, meaning the Mount, Mount Leinster. So maybe there, there is a, a, an earlier path to that. Okay, other questions. I, I, my wife always says I give the lecture again when I'm asked a question. That's okay, Kevin. I think everyone's quite happy to stay on. Um, just a comment from the great Michael Fortune, a great friend of the society here and, and well-known in Carlow, a good great Wexford man. He just makes the comments that Starlings were also called Black Stairs in South Tip 2 and all over the mid to North Wexford and also called Stairs throughout the county. Um, Patsy McLean wants to know um, about turf cutting on Mount Leinster, how much is known about it? And then... Um, Somebody else asked, asked a question. The cross in your opening picture, was that put up by the furlongs of Knock Roll? Uh, now, you know, you, the, the, I'll take the second question first. The answer is, I don't know. But it does say do a line on that. And I don't know what that cross is, uh, but I would very much like to uh, know more about it. I've never researched it, never looked at it or looked for it. But anybody who knows something about that, We'll know more about it than I do, because basically I know nothing. But what I'm saying is, this is something worth thinking about. What happened to that cross, and when did it disappear? Um, so that that's something that's uh, worthy of knowing. Um, who was asking me? Oh, somebody was asking me about turf cutting on, on Mount Leinster. Well, I'll just give you this one during the Second World War. And these were very famous people, by the way, James and Kate Bible or Bible. I don't know how you pronounce that name. B I B L E, spelled like Bible from birth. But uh, this is from the Echo, the 12th of October, 1940, courtesy, as usual, of my very good um, uh, friend, uh, Ken Hemingway, who sends me these wonderful tidbits from the local newspaper. Ken does fantastic work. But here it is. It's under the headline, Turf from Mount Leinster. 11 lorry loads of Mount Leinster black turf. Now, that's interesting. Black turf have been cut and saved by James and Mrs. Kate Bible of Burroughs for the use of the schools in the district for the winter. Uh, James Bible was a very famous spadesman. He could um, he could dig more land with a spade than uh, uh, anybody else in Carlow or Wexford. And here he is with his wife, who was obviously equally talented, up on the top of the mountain. But it's Mount Leinster black turf, and the black turf is the stuff that's beneath the the kind of a, the the heathery front top uh, layer of the turf, the, the good turf that you get uh, farther down. Wexford is unusual, isn't it? Um, I, I should maybe compare myself to Carlo, but I'm always kind of uh, reminded of that, that there's very little turf in Wexford, very few bogs, the Bog of Itty um, and the other ones that were in the middle of Wexford were um, cut out uh, or cut over very, very early. So there isn't really all that much uh, turf cutting, but there's definitely, um, definitely, um, you know, a commentary on the turf. And as I was saying earlier in the lecture, uh, especially on the Carlo side, um, that the, the turf was a really important uh, element of being able to reclaim high up the mountain because it gave you that crucial uh, winter fuel. Okay, other ones. I have one more question, Kevin. I think uh, um, yep. I think this one could go on for a little bit as well. <laughs> um, uh, Somebody is asking about Carrick Duff Castle. Can you tell us something about Carrick Duff Castle? Yeah, well, uh, Carrick Duff Castle is essentially Clonmullen Castle, from my way of looking at it. It's in the, you know, adjacent to it. Um, now, I, uh, if this, if I'm confusing the two of them, forgive me. But like, to my way of looking at it, as I said in the lecture, the most important, or one of the most important sites in, uh, in um, Carlow is the site of Clonmullen Castle. Uh, it was literally raised to the ground. We have a marvelous description of it from, from William Brereton's tour in 1634. That's well known. In more recent few months, I've been looking more closely at the cabinets and uh, very impressed with Donald Spanier uh, cabinet and his longevity. But there's quite a bit of material on Clonmullen. I mean, if you look at the early maps of Ireland, Clonmullen shows on uh, all of them. Uh, you know, so in various spellings, um, but it was very, very important and a very significant um, element of um, 
the North Carolina Atlantic. So I would I would want to be very um, you know uh, aware of that fact because it's disappeared and was literally raised, you know, knocked down, flattened, and it's disappeared. People don't tend to, you know, you don't visit it or you don't tend to uh, know about it so much. But I'm absolutely sure it is a crucial, crucial and well-documented part of uh, uh, Carlow history and one of the most important things that's in our parish. As you go up on the road there to from uh, Bunclody up to uh, the Blackstairs, as you go up uh, into uh, Kilbranish and Barnahask and all those uh, good places uh, along the side of the, the mountain there. But uh, the other thing about Clonmullen, which is interesting, is that uh, when the Maxwell Barries, uh, the Maxwells took over from the Barries uh, of Newtown Barry, they were essentially a cabin family, and they, they brought down a lot of families from um, from cabin to settle in Clonmullen. So in Clonmullen, to the present day, you'll get the Jacobs and the Moultons and a lot of families like that who were originally cabin families that were brought down there. And they're, they're a very well documented uh, set of families as well. Um, and many of those actually emigrated uh, in the early 19th century out to Toronto. Uh, there's many Moultons now from Kilbranish who are in, uh, have lots and lots of descendants of, in uh, on the Ontario area in Canada. So that's a big part of the story as well. Uh, but that, that um, the, to come back to the question about Carrie Duff Castle, now the question really that the person might have also been, was there another castle besides the Mullen, which was called Carrick Duff Castle? And they may know more about that than me. I don't claim to be an expert in castles. Or an expert on too much. Wexford Hurden, maybe. Anything else, I'll bow to anybody else. Just a final comment, Kevin. Are, are, would you believe then that Clonmullen Castle was Leverock as well? That, no, I, 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 I think that... Um, some of the early people who were writing about Wexford managed to uh, persuade themselves that uh, Leverock was um, in Clonigal and Cadavan. I don't think so. The Leverock Forest was actually down near Lachlan, uh, uh, not down near Lachlan, much farther south. It was down, down um, uh, way south in uh, Carlow. It had nothing to do with, um, with Wexford at all, uh, with uh, Clonigal and uh, Cadavan area at all. There's an argument kind of saying, oh, well, it could mean La Barak, you know, the parish of Barak. Um, our Clonigal parish is Mayakon. Then the next one over is Barak, B-A-R-R-A-G-H. And you could say La Barak um, is, means half of Barak and so Leverock. But I don't see any compelling um, uh, evidence for that. And uh, my good friend, Willie White, who was a member of the Carlo Historical, if I'm not mistaken, uh, you know, he used to always uh, argue that the Fidorica, which means the dark wood, was also in Clonigal. We claimed a lot of things in Clonigal. But again, I think that's not right. I think the Fidorica is uh, much more associated with uh, Shilela and over that district. So I think we have to give up on the idea that, um, you know, uh, uh, that the Fidorica and the Leverock Forest were in, in, in our parish. We have plenty of uh, woodlands to go around. The next town at the mine was Drumderry, and I found a marvellous reference from the 1660s to all the woodcutters uh, being in Drum Derry, uh, Drum meaning the hill and Dira meaning the oak woods, of them actually cutting the uh, oak woods in the 1660s. So we have plenty to be uh, going around without stealing, trying to steal other people's historical thunder. Kevin, I have another question came in here uh, directly to me. Does Kevin know anything about the barracks and buildings on the old Wexford Road near Knock Mulgurry, I think is the... Not Mulgurry. Yes, those, you know, uh, I, uh, the short answer is I do. The longer answer is not much. But the barracks and those things there, when, when I was I was beginning to talk there about um, the, the resistance to all those evictions and things that happened up there and the resistance, especially to in, uh, privatizing the commonages. And one of the key things that people did there was uh, you know, to make sure that any anybody that came up there got, shall we say, a very hot welcome. And then the, the option of that was that temporary police barracks and huts and different things uh, were put up there to try and, um, you know, stop people uh, doing that. And so I think that the barracks, as they were known, there, there are references definitely to that from the, the newspapers in the um, 1830s and 1840s. And again, there's a... The, uh, Ken, um, Ken Hemingway sent me many fine references to that from the newspapers at the time, but like there's really detailed uh, reporting of those evictions, especially the Kunog eviction from 1839 and 1840, but there's also tremendous detail about what happened at the Temple Ludigan side and the White Mountain, the Wexford side of that, and there's a lot of references there to temporary barracks and different things, so I think they belong to that phase, 
when local people were trying to stop the mountain being taken from them in the interest of private landlords. Kevin, hey, uh, just one. Oh, sorry, Paul, go go ahead, go ahead, yeah. I think we just one final question, um, and it's from Adrian Hume, and she just wants to know: Would you say something about St Mullins? <laughs> uh, would I say something? Yes, I would say plenty about uh, uh, St Mullins. I love St Mullins, and I want. But you know, you can't really talk about St Mullins without giving it a lecture all on its own. Um, St. Mullins is one of the most important sites. I've said there about Clonmullen. The other jewel in the crown of Carlo is definitely St. Mullins. Um, the, the amount of um, documentation there is for St. Mullins, especially in the early period, is amazing. The, the survival of the sites at St. Mullins is fantastic. There's five or six really important buildings at St. Mullins. We know a good deal about them. There's a very important early Indian century Catholic church. There's the earlier site, which was to do with baptism, which is a fantastically interesting um, thing. The, the, the early Christians in Ireland believed in, uh, shall we say, a more immersive form of baptism. And the whole setup for doing that survives at St. Mullins. Um, the, the, the Book of Mulling, uh, uh, Mulling uh, which is in Trinity, there's been a lot of more recent work done on that, which is fantastic. We know a good deal about it. St. Mullins is very well documented, much better documented, say, than Clonny Gall. And, uh, you know, it could do with a really, somebody to really get the bit between their teeth and write a good modern history of St. Mullins. But it's very well documented. And we have a lot, it, it's also, as I was uh, saying there earlier, I didn't want to bang on about it, but uh, the cabinet estate of Burris was really important because it preserved um, the local families. You know, there, there wasn't new families being brought in or whatever. So there's more continuity, I would say, in St. Mullins Parish than there is maybe in any parish in Ireland. So the same families have been there for centuries and centuries. So St. Mullins is fabulously interesting. And I also think, I want to kind of say this as well, because I think this is important, um, that St. Mullins has done a great job in recent years. Like the walk from St. Mullins to um, Great Namana is really, really good. Um, lovely, just really beautiful. There's a lovely coffee shop now on the banks there and in St. Mullins, which does a good business, I hope, um, and really lovely. You know, uh, but St. Mullins has everything that you would uh, look for even in a, a, the modern day. It's not the kind of big, blingy, um, you know, um, kind of tourism of, say, a Killarney. It's more, um, it appeals more to a discerning kind of person, but it's really beautiful. It has peace, it has quiet, it has history. It is everything that we need in our kind of modern, frazzled, never off um, kind of age. And I kind of think from places like St. Mullins, if we don't wreck them and if we you know, maintain them in the right kind of way, they have a huge amount to offer. And um, you know, I said earlier about the Blackstairs and I want to reiterate that, that really the problem with the Blackstairs is it's an unloved child because it's half a Wexford child, half a Carlo child, and uh, St. Mullins never get, uh, you know, uh, the Blackstairs never get a full look in. But if you actually did uh, a proper, um, you know, uh, integrated um, plan for the whole Blackstairs, it's just a magnificent area. And as I say, as I've been trying to say for the last hour or so, it's got this fantastically and fabulously interesting history as well. And it's got everything that we like nowadays, fresh air up on the mountains. And, you know, sometimes with mountains too, it can be a problem, can't it? Because if you're not the fittest, you can kind of uh, have a problem. But you, we've got a bloody road all the way up to the top of, uh, of Mount Leinster. You know, so even people who are maybe a little bit um, challenged on the walking or hill walking or, or doing strenuous kind of hikes or whatever can still get up there. Isn't that fantastic? So, you know, but I think like the, we could do much more and there's a great future for a, not a, a big, blingy, expensive, infrastructure heavy kind of tourism in Carlow and Wexford and along the Blackstairs, but for something which uses uh, the resource in a sustainable kind of way and which appeals to discerning uh, kind of people. Thanks, Kevin. Just to say that um, Rachel Murphy has put a link up to Mull's map of 1714 on the chat if anyone wants to go in there and have a look. Um, and equally, there's other bits and pieces. The other thing up on the chat, you'll see the link to our um, PayPal donations um, tip jar. Um, and we'd appreciate that. And again, appreciate anyone who wishes to join our society, which is 75 years old this year. Um, so on the formal bit, I'd go over to Gary to propose the formal vote of thanks to Kevin. 
Thank you very much, Pori. On behalf of Carlo Historical and Archaeological Society, I would like to thank Dr. Kevin Whelan for a brilliant and insightful lecture. We really appreciate the amount of research and information you have given us tonight. As Pori had said earlier, I think tonight has been the most popular lecture to date. It was highly anticipated, and Kevin, you didn't let us down. So again, thanks very much, Kevin, and I hope everybody enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks, Gary, for that. Um, Kevin, on, on, on my own behalf, and I think on behalf of, and as I said to you, we people from Peru to the US to Australia listening tonight, which um, we wouldn't have if there wasn't lockdown. Um, we've had a huge number. We wouldn't have fitted into a room had we been in a room. So look, it's been a great lecture, and thank you very much. Yeah, can I just say, if you don't mind, uh, sometimes uh, people like to know what the background is here. Um, we are, we, I'm based on Marion Square, I work with the University of Notre Dame, and uh, in the last year we were uh, privileged enough to be gifted the uh, library of Brian Friel, um, the, the great playwright uh, who was connected with us in a, a roundabout kind of way, but uh, Anne, Anne Friel kindly gifted us uh, this collection. We haven't been able to formally kind of uh, announce it or do anything with it really because of the COVID. Uh, but Brian, Brian's house was full of clocks. He loved clocks and he was an expert on human time. Uh, and this is, uh, this is one of his grandfather clocks as well. So if you're wondering what the backdrop was, that's what it was. So thank you very much, everybody, for joining. And I hope I didn't bang on too long. Thanks very much. Thanks, Kevin. I don't think anyone minded the time tonight. It was just a good night. Thank you. Super.